So often we think of, I eat a bad food and I get a disease. I eat something high in calories, I gain weight. I eat something high in cholesterol, my cholesterol goes up. But what I'd like to talk about today is a little different. It turns out that just about everything in your body is controlled by hormones. Thyroid hormone, insulin, estrogens, testosterone. These are the things that work all the functions in your body. And it turns out that foods control hormones and you can change it based on what you have for breakfast. So I got excited about it. And I wrote this book about it called Your Body in Balance. Um, if you actually shoot that QR code, you can skip the rest of this talk. Um, that will give you some information about it. Um, okay, so hormones. I want to start off with talking about insulin. Insulin is the hormone that's misbehaving in diabetes, right? Well, when I was a kid in Fargo, North Dakota, my dad was the diabetes expert. My dad grew up in the cattle business, hated it, left went to medical school and became Fargo's diabetes guy, I never once heard him say, I never heard him say that anybody with diabetes ever was cured or even got better. And here's kind of the scenario. Okay, I'm sorry, the blood sugar's up and the patient thinks, ah, oh, gee, how'd that happen? And the patient then, tell me if this is not true, starts thinking, okay, it was the sugar that I ate, or sodas, or maybe bread, and popcorn, all these things that turn into sugar, right? That's kind of the idea. Well, then what happens? Well, that means I'll be on medicine, I'll probably end up on insulin, and I'm never gonna get off any of this stuff. Stop. Let me show you what actually causes diabetes. It has nothing to do with anything I've talked about so far. This big purple blob, is a cell, a cell in your body, a, a muscle cell. And cells are powered by sugar, glucose. That's a good thing. Glucose is great. It gets into the cell and it gives them energy. The problem is the glucose is all around the cell. It's in the blood. And it can't get through. That cell membrane keeps it out. It can't break through. Except, well, I've got a key and the key is insulin, and the insulin is made in your pancreas and it goes through the blood to the surface of that cell and it attaches and it signals these little channels to let the glucose come inside. So in it comes and things are going well. Okay, great, super. My blood sugar's coming down, the sugar's getting in the cell. But what goes wrong is that's my dinner. And that's my lunch and that's my breakfast. I'm eating a lot of fatty stuff. Are those fatty? Yeah, sure, if you add up the fat that's in these things, it adds up to a lot. So, so wait a minute, we're talking about diabetes. Why are we talking about fat? What does that have to do with it? Here's what it has to do with it. The fat gets into the cell. Now, I'm not talking about belly fat or fat on your thighs. I'm talking about fat inside the cell. It's microscopic, and as it builds up, something happens. Now, doctors hate words like fat. It has only one syllable. So I'm going to call it intramyocellular lipid. And now I've got something I can bill you for. So intramyocellular lipid stops insulin signaling. But let me make sure we're really clear on this. Fat builds up inside the cell, and the key, this insulin key, attaches, but it no longer works because the cell is jammed up with fat. It's like if somebody put chewing gum in your front door lock, there's nothing wrong with your key, but is it gonna work in that lock? I don't think so. So your cells are not filled with chewing gum, they are filled with fat from the Velveeta package, fried chicken, steak, fried onion rings, all this kind of stuff, and now the glucose can't get into the cell anymore. See that? It stays outside, your blood sugar rises, and then you say, I guess it must have been the sugar I ate. Ah, uh -uh. it started with fatty foods. So, what happens if I stop eating animal fat? I'm, let's say I'm gonna be a vegan. How much animal fat is in my diet? There isn't any, right? And if I keep oily foods, fried foods low, what happens? Inside that cell, that fat starts going away. 
and bit by bit the fat dissipates and when it does the insulin that's normally in your body starts functioning again like it did when you were a teenager and now the glucose says okay I'll come back in the cell and everybody is happy am I saying diabetes can be reversed my research team was funded by NIH to see what we could do to improve diabetes treatment. And we brought in people who had diabetes. They had it for years. Half of them went on what we call a portion controlled diet. The other half went on a vegan diet. Portion controlled diet, if any of you have diabetes, this is gonna sound familiar. You need to lose weight, so let's cut your calories. I know what you're thinking. You're telling me I've gotta just be hungry every day. Yes, that's right, until you reach your, reach your ideal body weight. And then it gets old by about Wednesday. But we're gonna keep carbohydrate fairly steady and avoid bad fats like saturated fat. The plant-based diet or vegan diet didn't have any limit on calories or carbohydrate at all. It just said, don't eat the animal stuff. So instead of meat chili, we're gonna have bean chili. Uh, minimize oils and favor low glycemic index foods. Don't get hung up on that term. Uh, white bread is high glycemic index. It makes your blood sugar go up. Um, rye bread, it, your, your blood sugar doesn't rise as much. Uh, pumpernickel even more, uh, more slowly. Beans, uh, fruit, low glycemic index. Okay, fair enough. So to cut to the chase, the test that we use is called A1C. Does that ring a bell? A hemoglobin A1C, it's a, it's a test for your blood sugar, basically. And I want it below seven if you've got diabetes. And the people in the conventional diet, the portion control diet, that's the red line there. And they did pretty well. Their A1C dropped by about 0 0.4, absolute percentage points, good. The blue line is the people on the vegan diet. No animal products, minimizing oils, low GI foods. Their A1C dropped by 1.2 absolute percentage points, three times better than the best current diet, and in fact, better than all the oral medications that we could write a prescription for. And this was done with asparagus, or black beans, or brown rice, or fruit, or just simple, cheap stuff. Okay, so let me tell you, Vance was one of our first research participants. Vance was a policeman in Washington, D.C., then he worked in a bank. And he came and he told me about his grandparents. Both his maternal grandparents had diabetes. And he said, if I don't get my diabetes under control, I'm going to lose a leg. I'm probably going to go blind. And his diabetes was not in good control. He was on medication for it. And he was assigned to the vegan diet. And he said to me, this is the easiest diet I've ever done. And I was kind of surprised by that, because when people hear the word vegan, they do kind of think that you're going to have to acquire a taste for folk music or um, maybe uh, wear tie-dyed clothes, that kind of stuff. He, no, 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 no. Um, he said, prior diets tell you you've got to count calories. They give you a, a menu that adds up to 1,200 calories. You're hungry every day. By Wednesday, you're going to eat the sofa. And we didn't make him do that at all. We said, eat as much as you want. And the other diet said, count all your carb grams and don't eat too much bread, don't eat too much fruit, don't eat too much. We didn't tell him to do any of that. It was really easy. Just instead of uh, meat sauce on your spaghetti, have the chunky tomato sauce. Okay, fine. He lost 60 pounds over about a year. He stopped his diabetes medications and his A1C fell from 9.5, which is high, to 5.3, which happens to be absolutely normal. And I want to tell you something. When I got his lab test back, I had to close my office door. And I paced around for about 10 minutes to try to, I was trying to decide, could I tell Vance that he was cured? We had never imagined such a scenario before, that all traces of the disease just go away. But here was a man on no medication, with no sign of diabetes. He could go into any clinic in the world, and they would not diagnose diabetes. By the way, I was asking his permission to share his story, and he said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away too. Okay, so um, let me, let's get on the train. I want, I want to bring you up to New Haven, Connecticut, because some researchers in New Haven at Yale University's Department of Endocrinology did an important study. They brought in young people, 26 healthy volunteers, 
and they gave them a glucose tolerance test. I don't know if any of you ever had this. You take a little cup of like this sugary syrup, you swallow it down, and if your blood sugar goes up and it stays up and won't come back down, you are called insulin resistant. You're headed for diabetes. But if your blood sugar goes up and it comes right back down, you're insulin sensitive. That's fine. So you, you, you want to be insulin sensitive, not insulin resistant, okay? So who are these people? They were young, late 20s. They were thin, 130 pounds, 140 pounds, and they did not have diabetes. But now we're getting on the elevator. And all the people who were insulin resistant and insulin sensitive got on the elevator, went down to the basement, and there is a machine like this that does magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And what I can do is I can look inside your body. And I want to show you, I'm not going to get too technical here. Every, do you see the dots on the left side there? Every dot is a person. And that's the amount of fat inside your muscle cells, which you can't see, you can't pinch, but I can see it with this scanning device. And these are the people who are insulin sensitive, who are, who are healthy, who are normal. These are the people who are insulin resistant, meaning the fat has been building up inside their cells. And do you remember your mitochondria from high school biology? Those, those are your burners. That's the part inside the cell that gives you energy. In the healthy insulin sensitive people, they're working. In the insulin resistant people, they are slowed down. What am I saying? What I'm saying is these are young people. They are thin. They are healthy so far as they know, and they don't have diabetes. But the fat is already building up inside their cells, and I can measure it. And it's already causing their cells to not work very well, so they can't burn calories very well. They will not have diabetes for another 15 years or 20 years. But I can see it now. And you can go into any high school here in the Washington area or in the Midwest or on the West Coast or anywhere in the world, and you can get teenagers. You, if you will do this scan on them, you will see that they are headed for diabetes already. And this is not genes. This is, not, this is not their genetic heritage. This is chicken wings. This is Velveeta. This is stuff that they learn to eat in the school cafeteria. And that we serve them. And sometimes it's things that we didn't know better and we were serving at home because our parents gave that to us. So the thing is, we can change this. And we can change it now. Okay. And now I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. Geico has uh, its national headquarters about three blocks from my office. And after our diabetes results came out, they got excited about it and said, let's do a study at Geico. So what we did is we, we went to their headquarters. They got 2,500 employees in that building. And we said, anybody want to try a completely plant-based diet? If you want to lose weight, get your diabetes better, let's do it. And we did, and the results were really good. Um, people lost weight, their diabetes got better. So then Geico said, well, tell you what, we've got Geico facilities all around the United States. How about if we do this test at all of them? So we went to Macon, Georgia, and Dallas, Texas, and San Diego, and Buffalo, and in all these places, everybody was able to do a diet change. And what we found, well, well the first thing we found is that the cafeteria manager had to learn a little bit what vegan meant. <laughs> Anything wrong with this slide? Okay, sorry. Okay, we're gonna fix that. But anyway, after they took the bacon and cheese off the veggie burger, um, people did lose weight if they were in the vegan group. And their hemoglobin A1C, there, if they had diabetes, they got better. So what we were able to show is it's not just in our laboratory, with our support, that people can do this. People can do it anywhere. They can do it at work. They can do it at home. This is not rocket science. But it is the most powerful approach a deadly disease that we could imagine. Okay, all right, let me shift gears. We've been talking about the hormone insulin, and I can use foods to control my insulin. Who would have thought that? But it's true. There's another hormone, estrogens. Estrogens are female sex hormones, right? I'm sitting at my desk. My phone rang. It was a young woman who said, Dr. Barnard, I need your help. 
I can't get out of bed. This is this was a young woman. Her she was the daughter of another doctor in, in another part of the country, and her mother said, "Call Dr. Barner. He can help you." What she wanted was a prescription for some really strong painkillers, and she had a lot of women have menstrual cramps, but for maybe one in ten, they are off the scale cramps, can't get out of bed without a fistful of ibuprofen. And this was her situation. She had a business trip the next day. He said, I can't move, what can I do? She said, let me give you some, some painkillers to get you through today and tomorrow also. But I started thinking, wait a minute, this is gonna hit you again next month. She said, it happens every month. I started thinking, can we maybe change your body back toward a healthful way, healthful balance? I asked her to do something. I said, for the next four weeks, do you wanna do an experiment with me? No animal products and keep oils really, really low. She said, I'll try anything. You know, Fair enough, I'll do it. She called me back four weeks later and said, Dr. Brown, my period arrived today and I got nothing, no, no symptoms at all. What's the deal with this? I said, keep going and see what happens. She stuck with it and she was basically cured, except after a couple months, she started kind of wavering on the diet a little bit and suddenly the pain came back. So I thought, okay, this is one person who benefited. We need to see if this will work in general. So with the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Georgetown University, we brought in women who had menstrual pain, and half of them did this diet. The other half took a supplement that was actually a placebo, a dummy, doesn't mean one. After two months, two cycles, they switched, and the diet people started the supplement, the supplement people started the diet. And in a nutshell, it worked. We published the findings in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and what we found is that the pain intensity fell, the pain duration fell, uh, PMS symptoms, bloating, water retention, moodiness, all these improved with a diet change, not with medications. Well, what is that about? Let me show you. This is a woman, this is the amount of estrogen, female sex hormone, in a woman's blood. Starting with the beginning of the month, going through to the end of the month. And at the beginning of the month, there's almost no estrogen there at all. But as the weeks go by, about two weeks in, her estrogen peaks and falls. She has ovulated. She's, an ovary has released an egg. And then in the third week, I gotta tell you, the uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month it thinks, this is a big one. This could be it. So the amount of estrogen rises to thicken up the, the lining of the uterus. Uh, it's called the endometrial layer, to thicken it up in anticipation of pregnancy. But then at the end of that week, the disappointed uterus thinks, didn't happen again, and the estrogen level falls, and then menstrual flow is just all that is washed away, and it starts again the next month. Okay, so here's the thing. Food will change that. Change that whole curve. Okay, this will not be on the test, but I want to show you. This is, the, this is the uterus, okay? That's the uterus in the middle, and the ovaries are off to the side, and the fallopian tubes connect them. That pink lining in the middle, that's the endometrial layer, and it's thickening up. When Robin called me up on the phone and said, I can't get out of bed, I was making an educated guess that your endometrial layer is thickening up too much, and when that happens, at the end of the month, you get, it breaks down with menstrual flow, it releases what are called prostaglandins, which cause pain. And that's what's happening in your body. And there's another condition related to it called endometriosis which is the same deal, except those cells aren't inside the uterus anymore. They're implanting all around the abdomen. They look like little raisins, but what they are are cells that grow, that bleed, that scar, month after month after month after month. And you don't, you don't want them, I gotta tell you. They're on the uterus, they're on the ovaries, they're on your intestinal tract. And you're gonna think there is something completely wrong with my body. And if you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you've got endometriosis, we'll start with painkillers. If that doesn't work, let's put you on the birth control pill. You could be 15 years old, but let's start the pill. And then if that doesn't work, well, the operating room is just right down there. And after you've had surgery, and a couple years later, and it all comes back, 
don't worry. Your insurance is still good, right? We can operate on you again. And if you need operations again, we're there for you. Stop. When Robin called me up on the phone, the reason that I suggested this was because I was remembering some research. Tufts University, back in the mid-90s, they brought in a group of women and they tested various diets. They asked them to do a really low-fat diet or a high-fiber diet. They weren't thinking about menstrual pain. They were thinking breast cancer. Estrogen increases the risk of breast cancer. They thought, if I can bring it down, maybe I can prevent someone from having cancer. That was their goal, and in a nutshell, let me show you, it works. Um, just reducing fat alone. If you do nothing else, just cut, cutting fat. Estradiol, free estradiol, and other estrogen fractions, they go down. If you do nothing other than increase fiber, fiber is uh, plant roughage, beans, uh, vegetables, fruits. If you increase fiber, estrogen levels go down. So Robin calls me up, says, I can't get out of bed. This happens to me every single month. In my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm gonna give you painkillers now, but I bet you that if I really cut the fat and I really boost the fiber, I can calm those estrogens down and maybe there's a chance you'll feel better at the end of the month. And what's the best way to get the fat out of your diet? Eliminate animal products completely and keep the oils really, really low. And now everything that you're eating happens to be from a plant. Every bite has fiber. So I thought, let's max it out. If I can cure you, that's what I'm gonna do. And, okay, it works. All right, let me show, let me show you how the fiber part works. Fiber is the Clark Kent of the nutrition world. You know, nobody realizes it's hidden power, but fiber is roughage. And your liver, which is at the top of this picture, uh, pulls excess estrogen out of the blood. And it then goes down the, the bile duct, which you see there in green, and it ends up in the intestinal tract. And then the estrogens go down the intestinal tract and they're flushed away down the toilet. Except if my lunch was Chinook salmon or yogurt, those, those don't have fiber. They're not plants. Animal products never have fiber. In that case, the estrogens are reabsorbed into the bloodstream. See, there. And they end up back in the liver. And they cycle around. Doctors call this enterohepatic circulation. All it means is you can't get rid of your estrogens. You're absorbing them from your own <laughs> digestive tract. They're cycling around and around in your blood until a doctor says, let's go vegan. Now everything you're eating is a high fiber food. And bingo flush the estrogens away, and you get back to the level Mother Nature had in mind for you. Okay, want to make sure everyone's paying attention. Spam? Fiber? Fiber or no fiber? Trash can? Okay, there we go. Um, KFC, fiber or no fiber? Well, wait. If you eat the carton, there will be a little bit of fiber, but otherwise not. Okay, now there are some foods that started out as plants, but they went into a factory and all the fiber got like, extracted out of them, so they're gonna go too, all right? Pretty easy, isn't it? Okay, no big deal. Uh, Catherine, Catherine was an Air Force aerospace engineer who grew up in Louisiana. And in 2003, she got an all expense paid trip to Iraq um, to build military bases for the US Air Force. And when you're in a war zone, and you're working really hard, and you eat what the government is providing for you, you do not gain a whole lot of weight. And that was her situation. But eventually her tour of duty came to an end, and she was shipped back to the US. And her family picked her up and said, we are gonna make up for some lost time, Catherine. What did you miss? She said, oh, you wouldn't believe. We didn't have anything to eat over there. I miss cheese, I miss cheese snacks mac and cheese, all these kinds of things. And so a friend gave her an entire case, 48 boxes of mac and cheese, which Catherine ate for 48 days straight. Yes, she gained weight, and she developed endometriosis. And she went to the doctor and said, this is not good. And it gets worse, and it, it, it progresses. And they gave her painkillers, they put her on the pill. Nothing was really tackling the pain. It was getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, the doctor said, let's just take your uterus out. Let's do a hysterectomy. And she said, well, I'm only 27. 
and my husband and I are kind of newlyweds, and I, 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 I'd rather not have that surgery. And he said, I know what you mean, you'd like to raise a family, but listen, you've got very advanced endometriosis. You are almost certainly infertile now anyway. A hysterectomy will cure you of your pain. Okay. All right, I'll have the operation. She signed up for it, but they couldn't do it for the next six weeks. So six weeks later, she was signed up. But in the meantime, a friend told her about this diet that we've been doing. She gets all the animal products out of her diet. She keeps the oils really, really low. She's eating natural, healthy foods. And as time goes on, her pain goes down. And it goes down, and it goes down. But it wasn't completely gone. There was some residual pain that was bugging her all the time. So she thought, well, I'm infertile anyway. I may as well have the surgery. And she went to the hospital. And they put her on the table, and they put her to sleep. And an hour later, she woke up. And the doctor was there in the recovery room. He said, Catherine, I need to tell you something. I didn't do the hysterectomy. I opened you up, I, did a, I, I looked in with a laparoscope, and I don't know why this is, but your endometriosis is practically gone. And the reason that you had pain is you have scars where it used to be, and that caused your tissues to adhere, and all I had to do was free up th those adhesions. I think you're gonna be pain-free now. You still got your uterus, I didn't take it out. Her mother was with, with her in the room and her mother said, she went vegan. <laughs> and the, doc, the, doctor, the, no, the doctor said, look, wait, no. the doctor said, stop it, stop it. Listen, endometriosis has nothing to do with food and there is no way a diet change is gonna cure this. This must be a miracle. Well, good on the doctor for not taking her uterus out. But, but what he missed is that endometriosis is driven by hormones and hormones can be changed by diet. And they can change really, really fast, okay? So she's lost a ton of weight. She felt dramatically better. Um, and there are Catherine's three children. Um, and she then decided to dedicate her career to working with other women to figure out how you can assert your own health and take back your own health. So, wait a minute, I mentioned cheese. Does cheese have hormones in it? What's that about? Well, okay, cheese comes from milk, right? Milk comes from a cow. Cows make estrogens and cows are impregnated. They're impregnated every year by a not very nice method um, and then when the cow gives birth and this cute little calf is then taken away in a wheelbarrow um, uh, and every, everyone thinks that that's not so nice um, but the cow has been milked during the pregnancy what that means is if you're milked during pregnancy the estrogens from the cow's plasma are getting into the cow's milk and it ends up in your Velveeta or your milkshake or your yogurt. Every spoonful of any dairy product that your eight-year-old son or your six-year-old daughter ever ate had estradiol in it. Now the industry will say, oh, don't worry about it. Your body's making hormones and you add a little bit more. It's not gonna really affect you too much. Maybe not. Do you want hormones in your food that came out of a cow? There is no such thing as hormone-free milk. And to this day, there are dairies that go to the Food and Drug Administration and say, we have decided not to inject our cows with bovine growth hormones. So can we label our milk hormone-free? And the FDA writes back to everyone and says, no, you can't. There's hormones in every carton of milk. The cow made them, they are in there. And there is no such thing as hormone-free milk. You can market it in schools. You can tell kids they should feel guilty if they're not drinking this product. Uh, you can tell them that there's no calcium in any other foods except for so many other foods, like all the green leafy vegetables and so forth. It's uh, a lot of marketing and really not much science. Okay, in 2020, Gary Fraser and his team at Loma Linda University said, it could be worse than what we're talking about. It could be that the hormones in milk are associated with breast cancer. And what they did is they looked at a very large group of women, um, all Seventh-day Adventists, who, who are the favorite population of researchers to study, because it's a huge number of people who are all really health conscious, teetotaling non-smokers. And they vary in diet. Some of them have no milk at all, and some have a lot. Some have no meat at all, some have a lot. And it gives you a beautiful basis for comparison. And what Dr. Fraser reported 
I, I don't know if you can see this along the x-axis. It's the amount of milk the women were drinking. Quarter cup, half cup, one cup, two cups. The y-axis is breast cancer. And what he found is the more milk the women drank and the more estrogens went into their body, the higher their likelihood of getting cancer in the breast. Okay. We can use more research here, but we already know enough to decide that Mother Nature put milk in a cow's udder for just one, <laughs> one purpose. And it, it wasn't for us to come along and make ice cream. Okay. So what if, what if a woman had breast cancer already? She had the diagnosis of breast cancer. She's got one thing on her mind, I don't want that cancer to come back. It turns out that the more high-fat dairy products women consume, the higher their risk of dying of their cancer. Um, the red line here, those are women who have had cancer in the past, and they have one or more high-fat dairy servings a day, cheese, uh, whole milk, that kind of stuff. Their risk of dying of their cancer is 50% higher than the women who had cancer in the past and avoid dairy products. Okay, enough said. Okay, um, what did we talk about? We talked about insulin and diabetes. We talked about estrogens and pain uh, and cancer. What about the other end of the reproductive window? Let's talk about menopause. Um, you're sitting in the board of directors meeting. You're making your presentation. And suddenly, it's 150 degrees in the room. And this is called vasodilation, a hot flash. The blood vessels are widening in, and it's just like somebody turned up the radiator, and you it, people can see you sweating. And at night, it's 1.30 in the morning, you wake up, and you are in a pool of sweat. And you can change your pajamas, and two and a half hours later, it happens again, and your quality of life is going. <laughs> so researchers said, wait, wait, wait. Let's go to Japan. In the 1980s, Hot flashes were pretty rare in Japan. Maybe 15% of women had them. They were not very severe. They were mild. They didn't even have a word for them. And what was the diet? It was a lot of rice, not too much meat, uh, really no dairy products to speak of. But the Golden Arches arrived in Tokyo. And the diet westernized. And by the early 2000s, hot flashes were, 50, they were uh, more than 40% of the population. Breast cancer was way up. Heart disease was up. Lots of health problems that were endemic in the West were way, way up. Okay, so there's something about a Western diet that makes all this a problem. Now, the first thought was, well, soybeans were protecting them. Maybe. Soybeans have isoflavones like genistein and daidzein and glycetine. This won't be on the test either. Um, but those isoflavones reduce breast cancer risk, which is why soybeans are associated with reduced breast cancer, that's good, but they also seem to have a mild anti-hot flash effect. But that's not all there is to it, because if you get on a plane and you fly down to Cancun and you rent a car and you drive about two hours west, you'll be in Valladolid, and there's a little town next to it called Chichimila, and researchers went there and they interviewed more than a hundred Mayan women. And they found something interesting. They didn't have hot flashes either. Nothing. They said, yeah, I went through menopause, but I felt OK. Wait a minute. Do they eat rice? No. They, they have a grain. The grain is corn. And they don't eat soybeans. They got beans. The, the, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula, the traditional bean is the black bean. And they eat lots and lots and lots of them. They have lots of vegetables. Uh, like this one is called la chaya. And these were traditions for years and years and years and years and years. Okay. So my research team said, okay, instead of testing another HRT pharmaceutical, what if we see if we can make an optimal diet for hot flashes? And what we did is we brought in women who had hot flashes, and half of them went on a diet and half of them did nothing. And the diet was no animal products, and minimize oil. So it's sort of like the Japanese diet, only better. Like, no animal products at all. Beans and grains and healthy foods. And we also asked everybody to have a half a cup of soybeans every day. Okay, that was it. And the first thing we noticed is that over 12 weeks, the control group that got nothing gained weight. But the group on the vegan diet lost weight very nicely. 
almost eight pounds in 12 weeks. But their hot flashes improved dramatically. The moderate to severe hot flashes dropped by 84%. Good. And it got even better. If we looked at how many women had hot flashes, moderate to, se to severe hot flashes at all, it was everybody at the beginning. But by 12 weeks, only about 40% had any of them. And in the control group, no big change. All right. And then we looked at other symptoms not just the vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes, which improved much more in the experimental group than in the control group, but psychosocial symptoms like how's your mood? And physical symptoms, just how do you feel physically? And sexual symptoms. All of these improve much more in the plant-based group compared to the other group. Okay, so as soon as you mention soybeans to people, about half of them will say, well, I saw something on the internet that said that soybeans cause cancer. Isn't that right? Okay. Um, what happened was, back about 80 years ago, researchers discovered that isoflavones are in soy. And they do, in fact, attach to estrogen receptors. And that made people think they would increase breast cancer risk. But it turned out to be the opposite. In 2008, researchers summarized all the evidence to date and found that soy, women who consume the most soy have about 29% less risk of breast cancer. And if they had cancer in the past, their risk of dying of it was reduced. So you don't have to have soy, it's totally optional, but it reduces the risk of getting cancer and it reduces the risk of dying of it. Okay? So, all right, well this is getting good. I can deal with insulin and improve it, maybe not have diabetes. I can maybe, maybe get my estrogens to work better. Uh, menopausal symptoms might improve. And one other thing, your thyroid. Your thyroid oversees your use of energy, and it's a little organ you might not even know is there. It's right there in the base of your neck, a little butterfly-shaped thing. And if you are low in thyroid hormone, if you're not making it, you've got some symptoms that are kind of vague. Doctor. I got no energy. I feel kind of weak and fatigued and I'm, I'm gaining weight and my hair doesn't look right. The doctor will say, this sounds maybe vague to you, but I have an idea. The doctor draws some blood and says, your thyroid hormone is just not doing what it's supposed to. Um, but the opposite can happen. You can be hyperthyroid, where you're losing weight and you're kind of revved up. And that's because your thyroid is making too much thyroid hormone. Can I fix that? Maybe. This is thyroid hormone. It's called thyroxin. And you see those purple, purple uh, atoms there? That's iodine. It comes from the Greek word iodes, which means purple. And iodine is something that is not in a lot of foods. But if you don't have it, you can't make thyroid hormone. So where can I get it? Well, back in 1924, the Morton Company said, I'm gonna put it in salt and everybody's gonna have iodine, and that's true. They pretty much wiped out iodine deficiency. But we are modern Americans. We have sea salt and kosher salt and Himalayan salt, which don't have iodine in them unless it's on the label. And so our iodine levels went down and hypothyroidism is going up. All right, now, it doesn't have to be in iodized salt. Seaweed is nature's best source of iodine, actually. It's, it's the wrap in your nori, it's the little wakame flakes in your miso soup, but, but a lot of folks in Herndon don't eat seaweed. Um, if we were in Japan, we'd probably have it every day. Um, but uh, when we return these things to our diet, we get the iodine that our body needs. Uh, I, little caution, kombu or hijiki are two seaweeds I suggest that you don't make a big part of your diet. Uh, hijiki has arsenic traces in it, and kombu is just so darn high in iodine. It's like explosively high. You don't need that much, okay? All right. Um, now, the dairy industry will say, wait a minute. We've got iodine. There's, there's iodine in milk. That's true. And do you know where it comes from? The cow's udder drags through mud sometimes and gets a little fecal staining on it. And so before the cow is milked, they put an iodine disinfectant on it. And then they put the milking tubes on and some of the disinfectant gets into your milk. And they'll say, that's a great source of iodine. Anyway, you had to be there. Okay, so, all right. Now, another source, another reason why the thyroid is not behaving is because we have antibodies to the thyroid. 
here's what I mean. You could go to the doctor, and your doctor can do blood tests and finds all these antibodies in your blood. An antibody is a protein that was made by your white blood cells. It's like a little torpedo that's looking for a virus. That's right, your white blood cells are patrolling and viruses get into your body and bacteria will get into your body and your, your immune system depends on antibodies. So the antibodies attack the virus, knock it out. But your defenses are confused. So sometimes other kinds of proteins can get in there and you make antibodies to them too. So when you make antibodies, some of them attack your thyroid gland and they shut it down. So you're hypothyroid, that's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. A Dr. Hashimoto discovered this and it just means you're turning off your own thyroid. And there's another one called Graves' disease, which is attacking the thyroid regulatory machinery, so you can't turn it off. And your thyroid is running overtime. In both cases, it's antibodies your body makes that are attacking you. Okay, let's go back to the Adventist Health Study. They looked at a whole bunch of people and said, how often are you getting hypothyroidism? And what they found is the vegans have less, the lacto-ovos have the most, and the omnivores are in the middle. And the hypothesis is, that dairy proteins, or maybe meat proteins or egg proteins, are mistaken by your body as foreign proteins. Like, like it's a virus. And your body makes antibodies that end up attacking you. See what I mean? And the vegan's not doing that. So they looked at hyperthyroidism. Same story. The vegans had the least, the omnivores had the most, and they said, okay, it must be that somehow these proteins are getting into your body because you're swallowing them and your body mistakes them for an invader and makes antibodies that are turning around and hitting you. And there are many autoimmune conditions. Rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's disease, eczema, asthma that often remit when we get these foreign proteins out of our diet. See what I mean? Now, we don't know for sure how well the diet works because nobody has done a randomized trial of a completely vegan diet for hypothyroid patients. But a lot of people said, well, I'm not waiting. I'm just gonna do it on my own. This is Nancy. Nancy was 49, she was an accountant. When she was 19, she was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And she was on, uh, on her levothyroxine, but still not doing very well. And she gained weight, and her cholesterol went up. In fact, they both went up to the same number, 265. And she heard about this diet. Let me just give this a try. And she did. She started a totally plant-based diet and her weight came down, as many of you have experienced. Weight goes down, 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 down. Cholesterol goes down, 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 down. And her doctor said, I don't know what you're doing, but if I were you, I would keep doing exactly what you're doing. And he took her off her thyroid medication and she is euthyroid, meaning no thyroid disease. And she feels a whole lot better. And instead of being self-conscious about her weight, she decided, I'm gonna lace up my sneakers. And here's a picture that she took when she ran a 5K. So if you wanna try this, don't cancel your doctor's appointment and don't throw your medicines away for any of these conditions. Work with your doctor, but your doctor, who may not have a clue about nutrition, does know about monitoring your medical condition and can take you off the medications safely and at, at the appropriate time. And that's a good thing to do, okay? so. What's a healthy diet? A healthy diet is fruits and grains and legumes. Legumes are beans, lentils, peas, uh, vegetables, and you need vitamin B12. You need it for healthy blood and healthy nerves. And you don't need much, but a supplement that you can get at CVS or any health food store has you covered. But how am I gonna do this? You know, if you turn to somebody else and say, you could lose weight, you could turn your diabetes around. You might be able to help your health in many, many ways with a plant-based diet. That's logical. But logic plays almost no role in human behavior, as you know. Um, if a person is planning their breakfast, they don't think, you know, I could use maybe seven grams of fiber. I could use some beta carotene. Let me plan my diet accordingly. People don't do that. Their breakfast is based on noise. I'm talking about media, advertising, stuff like that, or, or their culture, what their parents say, or wishful thinking or addictions and that kind of stuff. And that's what determines what we're gonna do. So you can be talking to your friend 
and you can be saying, this is really good stuff, this diet. And, and for any doctors in the audience, I'm gonna t we're gonna talk about the neurology of decision making. You're telling your patient, this is the brain, you're telling your patient or you're telling your friend that a plant-based diet is good, and the ideatron then says, oh really? Well, I'll make an idea like I should go plant-based. But the ideas then irritate the famiglia, which then triggers the don't do it terry gland to exude ignorance. And while you're talking to your friend about this, the ignorance come up, and after about 30 seconds, they'll turn to you and say, yeah, but where do you get your protein? Give laws. This isn't going to work. So that's not what we do. We don't try to use logic alone. When we have a person who wants to follow a healthy diet, here's what we do at the Barnard Medical Center, and this is what you could do too. Take a week, and just don't take anything out of your diet. For this week, all we're gonna do is to think what I would eat if I was following a plant-based diet. And I'm gonna make a list. So take a piece of paper and write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, and take a week and just write down things that you'd like, and, and test them out. If you like them, put them on the list. So oatmeal's okay, but I gotta flavor it up with some cinnamon and blueberries and make it kinda nice. And um, let's see, my cousin told me about those vegan sausages that are indistinguishable from pork sausage. I guess I could buy them and see if they're any good. Okay, if you like them, write them down. Okay, uh, for lunch, could I have a pizza without cheese? I don't know, try it. You got seven days, if you like it, put it on the list. Um, oh, and we're gonna go to my favorite Italian place. And my angel hair pasta, they told me they could top it instead of a meat sauce, but with a chunky tomato sauce with fresh basil, or they have one called the arrabbiata sauce, which is Italian for angry. It's vegan, but it's really super spicy and delicious. Or Latin American, that's even easier. Veggie fajitas, bean burritos, beans and rice. Okay, if you like it, goes on the list. Uh, wait a minute, Chinese restaurants have about 30 things. Rice dishes, tofu dishes, vegetable dishes, all different kinds, including some I never heard of. So, I got a week, let's see what we think. Oh, extra points for Japanese. It's not only a lot of vegan stuff, like the cucumber rolls, the sweet potato rolls, the asparagus rolls, but they, they really minimize oils for almost everything on the menu. So, okay, I'm in. Now, Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, as Chuck told you. However, um, if you go there and you got the bean burrito, hold the cheese, it happens to be vegan. Okay, so I got, fine. A week is, is, has gone by, I've got my list. So now step two is take a week, uh, take three weeks, and now I'm gonna eat all vegan all the time as a three week test drive. And at the end of that time, two things happen. The first is, physically you have changed. You're losing weight. Your blood sugar is coming down, your digestion is better, your mood is better. If you're a runner, you find, my times are a little bit better. I, I don't know why, but I'm gonna keep doing this. But the other thing you notice is that your tastes are changing. Is this not true? I mean, at, at first, you know, things seem kind of light, but then as time goes on, you discover, man, I haven't had chicken wings in a couple weeks. I, I, I don't really miss them especially. Um, and you notice that your tastes are changing and you're discovering new books new websites, new restaurants, new products at the store. And a lot of friends say, well, I've been doing this, where have you been? And there are all kinds of people making this really, really super easy. Um, we have a resource I'd like to share with you. This is our 21 day vegan kickstart. This is an app, it's free. You go on your iPhone, go on your Android, just put on the 21 day vegan kickstart and you can download it, it's in English, it's also in Spanish. We developed this for our doctors to use for patients but a lot of people just download it on their own. They really love 21 Day Vegan Kickstarter. Um, this is my book, Your Body and Balance. Um, we have some copies over there at, our, at the PCRM booth. And uh, I, I do have one request. If you do happen to get a copy, let me ask you one thing. Share what you learned with somebody else. And if you have a doctor, you might let your doctor know what you're doing. Because you now know a lot of things that other people never thought were possible. A disease can improve, can maybe go away. Maybe instead of more medications, I can have less. Pain could go away. We're not gonna live forever. Our fragile bodies may not permit that. 
but we can live much better than before, and many people don't have that knowledge. And I'm sorry to say that doctors are so focused on learning how medications work and learning how to do monitor with medicines, they don't really give much attention to, to food, and they're skeptical, because they, and, and, and kind of with good reason, because there's a lot of fluky diets out there that they've heard about, and they think, like, don't do that, you know? And so they're overly skeptical, even when diets have been proven to work in NIH-funded research published in peer-reviewed journals. That's what we do. But anyway, um, the nice thing about this is, at Green Fair and every place else, people are exploring all different ways of applying diets. Foods are fun. They're good for the animals, that's for sure. The animals will wave their white handkerchiefs at you saying you're the best. The, the environment will breathe easier. Your coronary arteries might too. Thanks very much. <laughs>